When it comes to discussing our bodies, we often get a little uncomfortable. Women's health issues are often seen as off limits, taboo topics we just don't talk about. It's time for that to change. Let's talk. Welcome to the Brave Mama podcast, where we are going to do exactly that. Discuss everything from periods to pregnancy, motherhood to menopause. No topic is off limits. Join Stephanie Thompson, the brave mama and author of The Day My Vagina Broke, as she asks other brave women about their personal health challenges and triumphs. You will learn, laugh and cry as Stephanie finds out everything you wanted to know but were too afraid or embarrassed to ask. So, grab a cuppa and enjoy. Hello and welcome to The Lowdown with Brave Mama. I am your host, Steph Thompson. Today's episode is absolute gold. I am so honoured that in all of my digging in this Brave Mamahood journey for the last three years, I feel like I've finally found something I can bring to you that is a bit of an answer to the question I've had for a really long time. And that is, how do I ensure that what happened to me in my birthing suite never happens to my little girl Elsie? And I feel like what we're talking about today is 100% a positive step in the right direction. I know that my antenatal pre-birth care was really brief. It was like an hour session at the hospital and I also paid for private sessions. I felt like I read every pregnancy book I could and I still felt blindsided and surprised about what happened to me. And then to find out that it's actually more common that I wasn't just unlucky. I didn't just fail vaginal childbirth only made me, well, it made me mad, but it also made me more driven to ensure that, well, if we know better, we absolutely can be doing better. And our guest today, Kimberly Smith, who's a champion netballer, a mum, a health and fitness advocate, has really shone a light on how we can be unpacking this and making it better because she co-founded with her women's health physio friend, Liz, the Empowered Motherhood Program. She's going to tell you all about it in the episode. I'm just going to tell you, I love this. I love this for so many reasons, but the most thing that stands out to me is that they have really looked at vaginal childbirth and cesarean section childbirth and how to hold space for women no matter how you birth. And that is so good. The other thing I love about this is that it's something I don't feel has been done anywhere before. I've never seen it. It is two women who are also pregnant on this journey with you. As they created this app, there's a pregnancy. And so they really know how to talk to you because they're going through the same things you are. How amazing is that? We are going to get into this episode, and today I have grabbed myself a cup of Madame Flavor's English Brekkie. I love this as a staple in my kitchen. I have it every single morning, first thing, and one day my hope is that something just like this Empowered Motherhood Program will be a staple that is offered to our daughters and their daughters as an everyday common thing. Just like you have an English brekkie tea in the morning, it's available. I want something just like this to be a staple in every pregnant mama's journey. So let's get into it. Hi Kim, it's so lovely to have you on the show today. Thanks so much, Steph, and I am so honoured to be here and I'm really uh, grateful to you for asking me. Oh, yeah, it's um, it's quite funny how we met, wasn't it? It was almost like in a car park at a women's health physio slash Cairo where we just kind of discovered that we had so much in common and um, yet I probably would have never shared that with you had we not been in that very specific space at that specific time. So, um, yeah, let's let's talk about that. So, Kim, tell us. Who is Kim the mum? Um, as a mum, I so I have three little girls. Yep. I run my own business. Okay. Before becoming a mum, I was quite driven. And I think motherhood's changed me in a lot of ways. I guess we'll sure. get into all of that. But I 
I almost consider myself a full-time stay-at-home mum and with also a business running. So it's a lot that I juggle, but I'm very hands-on as a mum. I think I'm quite, yep. you know, naturally maternal um, and awesome. I love being around my girls, but also just being a mum drives me insane. So I, I <laughs> definitely need the outlet of work and I'm really passionate about what I do um, and I'm incredibly um, self-motivated, so I'm quite a good work from work from homer (laughs) yeah yeah, Um, good and i love you know all things health and well-being i'm quite into yoga quite spiritual um and very into exercise especially um i have always been my whole life but i think now i see it a lot more as a form of um more of rehab and of self-care than than a form of punishing my body which perhaps it used to be (laughs) Uh, yeah, I've you know I've seen that meme. I love it at the moment. Is that that um, exercise is a way to nourish your body, not punish it for you know the chocolate that you ate that day. And I just thought, wow, I wish I had that message when I was in my teens. <laughs> yeah, I think um, you and I probably grew up in the era of like skinny is <laughs> you know optimal Good. and exercise to punish and calories in and calories out and diets yes. and I think um, thankfully it's changing so much more and I think for mm-hmm. those of us who lived through that time and had that message growing up we've really seen the consequences it's had on our body and our mental health and we don't want to pass it on to our children so we're really yes. conscious um, I know I am of never talking about dieting, of only talking about the benefits of exercise, but mentally, physically, socially. So yeah, it's um, we had to live through it, but hopefully I think society's changing a lot now. Yeah, we can shift it. So Kimmy, you said you've got three beautiful girls. I can only assume that those birthing experiences were all probably quite different. Would you mind sharing those with us? Yeah, I, I had three quite different births. They're all similar in the fact that they were vaginal births and I was quite yep. active through them all, but they were quite different. My first, um, my firstborn was quite a long labor, probably around 14 hours of active labor. Okay. And I was really adamant I didn't want any, any um, epidural, um, a minimum, minimum intervention. Um, okay. But I think I was... Can I, mm. can I jump in there? I'm so sorry. And I, please, I don't, I try not to jump in, but... I'm interested to find out, and I think a lot of mums are, where did that belief come from? Like your thoughts about not wanting an epidural and things like that. Do you, um, you might not even know, but do you know where that kind of, that thought process started for you? Yeah, I do. So I did a calm birth course um, and that was very anti all drugs, anti intervention. And it also never spoke about pain. It spoke about it as pressure. Um, and I mean, that course is, was beautiful. I felt incredibly um, positive going into my birth. But yes. I remember saying to my husband, if this is not pain, I do not know what is. And, and <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll get into it. But I was a late athlete. Like I was used to pushing my body through all kinds of pain thresholds. That yeah. just knocked me out. Um, I could not believe the pain I was in. And to be confronted with that, in the middle of labor felt really overwhelming um, and and created a lot of fear in me. So I did end up having gas um, a lot, which made me really sick, but um, I was still, I'm a pretty like stubborn-y kind of person. So I was pretty adamant I didn't (laughs) want the epidural, Um, but I was also really fearful. So I stopped moving around a lot towards the end because the pressure um, and the and the weight of my uterus and the contractions and the intensity just felt really overwhelming. So I ended up giving birth on my back with my one leg yeah, on my okay. husband and one leg on my midwife. Um, and I pushed for just over an hour and my baby, she was a really big little girl. She was 4.3 kilos, had a giant head, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> um, so Thanks. she was really big. And so I, I, I don't think that that was the beginning of all of my um, physical issues, but it definitely contributed to them. Um, And I can get into that later, I think, probably. Um, So my second birth was completely different. It was four hours from start to finish, incredibly intense, Um, just going from nothing to everything in those four hours. Um, And the most memorable part of that was I was really, I did not want to give birth on my back again. 
Um, and so I was all ready to birth her. I was in position and my water broke and there was meconium in the water. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Maybe for our listeners, just explain a little bit so about that because if, they may or may not know. Yeah, so um, meconium is basically the baby's first poo, which they can do inside the um, the womb. And so when the water breaks, it comes out looking, you know, this greeny, blacky color. And so it can be a sign that the baby's in distress. Um, and also if, they've, if the baby's done that, if they've just done it recently, it, it might be fine. But if they've done that a while ago, it could, you know, it just increases the risk for the baby. So my midwife rushed over to the wall and was smashing the, you know, um, emergency and saying, don't oh, push, geez. don't push. But she was coming into the world. So I was halfway from the ground where I was birthing up onto the bed. I, I had one leg on the bed. And her head had come out. And so you can imagine that was really uh, stressful. I thought there was something wrong. I, you know, my first thought was like, Ooh. is she alive? Like what's, what's happened? She was fine. She's a beautiful, healthy baby, like totally fine. But that was, you know, that was an intense experience. Um, and I think so I carried least. some of that with me into my next pregnancy because I was actually really anxious through the whole pregnancy, um, the third pregnancy. I think... T- I was anxious for a few reasons. I think if you've got two healthy children, you feel quite lucky (laughs) um, and grateful and blessed. And so you're also aware of, um, I think, a lot of more of other people's struggles. So I felt just, you know, too lucky. Um, By then, my prolapse and incontinence symptoms, which I haven't spoken much about, but which I had after the birth of my first daughter, I was really aware of the longer term effects of living with E because it was five years from my first to second. I mean, my first to third, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Um, so those those increased symptoms during my third pregnancy made me feel quite anxious. And then I think I carried some of that my second daughter's birth into it. So because of all of that and because I didn't want to have another giant baby, I asked to be induced. <laughs> and um, With the third, yeah, for my third. And I really pressured that home that that was what I wanted for my birth um and you know looking back I don't know if I would have made that same decision but at the time I think it was the anxiety feeding that that need to be in control of something so I was induced for her and I was really lucky it was really beautiful induction birth it was probably my easiest birth I was induced about eight o'clock in the morning and I had her at lunchtime um I gave birth kneeling on all fours. My midwife was incredibly protective of my pelvic floor. So, yeah, quite three different births, um, but very lucky in that um, three very healthy babies as well. (laughs) Yeah. And it's funny that, you know, from the amount of women I've spoken to even during this podcast, it seems to be like this reoccurring thing that the first baby paves the way. It's the longest labor. It's generally, um, from the women I've spoken to, the hardest one. And they seem to get easier with each subsequent birth. Wouldn't it be amazing to be able to um, find a way to, to get past that hurdle so that we get more like number two and three possibly, or not so much the traumatic part of your number two, but the number three? Yeah. Like, I think that's everyone's dream, right? But um, I think baffled though, to know how we, how we get there. Yeah, your body... It's, it's so funny, but your your body knows what to do the second and third time. You're, it's such an intricate dance between you and your baby the first time. And so I think, you know, we almost need to go through that because our body is learning how to birth. We've never birthed before. So it is, you know, anything we do the first time is going to take longer. So that's why I just am amazed by the women who bring so much calm and grace to their to their first birth. And have so much trust Same. in their bodies um, because if you can get beyond the fear, um, yeah, then, then your body opens and it allows. And, um, and I think that's the beautiful lesson of strength in motherhood. It's not necessarily about how hard you can push. It's about how sometimes how soft you can be. So, yeah. How you can let go. Let go. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I um I did a calm birth course too and I um, thought that as you were saying – describing yourself I was just sitting here going my god we're so kindred spirits because being a quite an a-type personality who thought I can conquer the world just watch me um you know can make water more wet type 
thought processes is that um, when I did the calm birth class, I thought, yeah, I've got this. I know what, I know how to do that. I've been practicing. I've been doing those meditations. And then when it, those strategies were no longer working, and I think um, for me because my baby was posterior, I never knew what it felt like. I couldn't actually feel my contractions. I didn't have epidurals and things like that. I went along that process of, you know, um, natural birth, it was called. I like to call it vaginal birth now, but um, went through that process. And then when it came, it's like, okay, you're having a contraction. I remember knowing, not thinking, oh, I can't actually feel anything. And it wasn't until the second birth. I'm like, oh, that's what it feels like to push. Now I know that it just felt totally different. I was like, I get it now, you know. And that makes it um so much easier. But um anyway, I'd I'd like to know a little bit more about um who was Kim before she was a mum, right? Because before you're a mum and a wife and a business owner, you were Kim. Tell us about that. Yeah. Um so I sort of alluded to it before. I was I was quite type A sort of personality. So I played elite netball for the New South Wales Swifts and was a member of the Australian netball squad. And so I was first selected in sort of that level of netball. The competition was a bit different then, but in my final year of high school. So I played that level for 12 years, I think. Um, wow. That's and so that was a huge part of who I was. Um, and at the same time, I studied law. So I was also um, in 2007, I was playing that elite netball and working, trying to work sort of almost full time as a corporate lawyer. Um, wow! <laughs> I know it sounds like incredible, but I I just absolutely wore myself into the ground. Like it was just so <laughs> so um, not sustainable. Um, and so I also I think because I was so burnt out, um, and I was sort of getting to the age where I wanted to have children that I quit law. I retired from netball okay. and I sort of just gave everything up. I had my, maybe I had my midlife crisis early. Um, sure. And I moved into the health and fitness area because I remember when I was a lawyer, they asked me what did I want to specialize in and sort of gave me this list of all of these things in corporate law. And I thought none of them were particularly, I wasn't particularly passionate about any of them. I liked the competition. I liked the intellectual aspects of law. I liked problem solving, but I wasn't that passionate and so I thought, what am I passionate about? I'm a passionate about exercise and passionate about health. You know, that's what I, that's all the magazines I buy. That's what I always chat to people <laughs> about, you know. That's, yeah. um, and so I, I moved into that space and I was really lucky. I was, I had a, um, a group fitness business right near where I lived. So I started working with them and then I became an owner in that business. And that was sort of the introduction into the health and fitness world. And it allowed me to do all my training and everything before I had children, which was really nice. And then, um, so then I think that sort of set me up for the second stage of my life because I really wanted to be around my kids. It was just the type of mother I wanted to be. Um, yeah, that I felt balance. That quite strongly. Yeah. And, um, but I also knew because of those parts of my personality, I wasn't a mum to sit around making Play-Doh or, you know, I, okay. I, I have such admiration for women who, um, can be so present with their children and so in the moment all the time but that it's just not me and I often feel a lot of guilt about that um but you know it's just yeah, not me <laughs> um, yeah. I love them and then I really want to go and do my own thing so I think you know I've, I've come to the place now where I for a long time I tried to deny all those competitive aspects or you know driven aspects of myself because I didn't see how they fit into my role as a mother whereas now I'm kind of yeah come to peace with it you know there's there's two parts of me um I'm a Gemini as well so I see those like quite distinct parts of me um yeah <laughs> so yeah I love your honesty Kim thank you for being just so open because when you were saying you know that you were at that top elite level at netball and a lawyer my eyebrows just went holy moly that's so admirable but then when you just shared with us it actually burnt you out and it wasn't actually healthy it wasn't something that you admired within yourself to then go and change that because a lot of people just stick at it don't they they just keep going and going and going until they can't do it anymore so to be able to change that it's pretty amazing so with um 
So now between, I mean, it's, it sounds like you've got a really good balance. Do you have any struggles between the business that you're doing now, which I want to talk about next, and motherhood? Yeah, I do. Um, so I th- I feel like in a way, motherhood goes most smoothly when you do everything your kids want you to do. <laughs> and it's most <laughs> yeah, stressful it's so when true. you try and do something you want to do. Um, and the work I do in um, maternal health, um, I'm so incredibly passionate about and I could sit and do that all day long. And the fact that I have to go slow with it, and it drives me insane. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But then if I'm not there to see my kids play their netball game or I miss, you know, they miss a play date because I have to work, I, I also feel guilty about that. So um, I, I do something, I, I, I've made a list of what I really value in my life at the moment, Okay, like yes. my, my health, um, working on something that I feel passionate about, having a purpose that's bigger than myself and my family. Um, and, and within family, I, I sort of include friends and community and, and those things, I know I'm passionate about all of those things. So I make it a priority to make sure I'm trying to incorporate them all into my life. And sometimes it means maybe I'm not, you know, as present as I like to be. Maybe the kids watch the iPad or they're on, you know, watching mm-hmm. the TV yeah. while yeah, I'm yeah. working or, you know, sometimes I'm like, just please give me a minute. I've got to do this email, you know, it's. I don't love that about myself and I see their little hearts go, oh, and I, I feel bad. But then, you know, at other times I'm with them the whole day and I don't get a chance to answer their emails I want to. So it's just, it's this balance that we never get right. And I sort of think I don't try and pressure myself to nail it every day, but over the long term, I try and make sure that I am putting effort into the things I value. Yeah. And you know what, to be honest, I think, I look at other mums as well and think, wow, I love how you look so engaged with your kids and everything is your are your children. And my background is in education, so I did an early childhood degree because I loved kids so much and all I wanted to do is play with kids all day. And the only thing I never want to do is play with my kids all day yeah now. it's like <laughs> yeah. what happened to me? I loved kids and now I see my kids and as soon as I see them playing happily. I'm like, I'll just go put that washing out. I'll just go and, like you said, answer that email. I'll just fix this text or whatever it is. It is so hard because I know that that guilt of being, all I wanted to ever be was a mum and now I am. All I now want to do is a little bit of that work and a little bit of that. I just want to try and find that balance. And I love that you say that you can't ever quite, you're never going to have it right all the time. No. No. And that's the thing. It's going to tilt this way one day. It's going to tilt that way one day. But how good does it feel when you actually do get it? I just get a walk out of my office sometimes just going, right, kids, I'm all yours. Yeah. What I are we doing? That. Let's play cubby houses. And then I think I look at my watch and I'm like, wow, it feels like we've been here for two hours. And I think it's been 10 minutes. Like it's, it's really hard to say that sometimes play is just boring like what they're doing is not engaging me, but I have to step up and be like, okay, yeah, I'll pretend to have that Barbie thick shake for the 10 hundredth time. <laughs> and and that's what you do. And the seeing the smiles on their faces, that's good. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's hard. It's yeah. really hard. Yeah. I always try and get like my kids play to incorporate something I like. So, you know, taking them outside for a walk or, you know, scooter rides so I can walk or, you know, things – yeah, because I'm not good at like being bad Elsa. But... <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. Or oh, the fact that my son has his obsession at the moment. I don't have no idea where he got it from, but he likes tying people's hands together and I'm concerned that he always <laughs> wants to tie me to a chair or something where I can't move. And I'm like, mate, I can't do this. <laughs> He's three. Many. <laughs> Too many. <laughs> <laughs> too many movies <laughs> I think so let's let's just hope um can we tell us because I know we, we kind of have danced around it a little bit your empowered motherhood program I just love the name to start with tell us what is it how did you start it you know I guess it's like your fourth baby too right 100% is my fourth baby. So the Empowered Motherhood program is a um, collaboration between myself and women's health physio, Liz Evans. 
And she was my physio uh, originally when I was first diagnosed with prolapse and incontinence. And together, I think from her clinical perspective, she was sick of hearing women say, why didn't anyone tell me? And for me, my personal experience, I, I could not believe the lack of support women were given in the postnatal period. And so we decided to create a program that catered just for men in pregnancy and postnatal, and especially for those women who have suffered complications or not even complications, just women who have pelvic girdle pain in pregnancy or pubic pain or have had a C-section birth or um, you know, have back pain from breastfeeding, just everything that women are so often ignored. And so we, we, the Empowered Motherhood program includes over 300 um, physio-led workouts um, plus expert oh, wow. education from a group of incredible experts, including like obstetricians, psychologists, lactation consultants, midwives, and it's all in a complete week by week program, sort of starting from first trimester all the way through to birth, early postnatal recovery, and then advanced postnatal sort of return to running, return to impact. Um, and yeah, we're incredibly proud of it. It's, um, it, it's been, um, we launched in March last year and it's just okay. been really well received. Um, I think women were just desperate for something that didn't treat them as a modification or an addition to another program, but actually gave them exactly what they needed for exactly where they were at. Um, and we filmed it through our own pregnancies and postnatal recovery. So it's okay. very real. <laughs> Having that lived experience, you can't you can't get any better than that. No. And so it meant, yeah, we had to be really patient with it because it took a long time to prepare, obviously, a whole pregnancy and a whole postpartum. Um, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, now I think um, just the fact that we're at the exact same stage of pregnancy that, as the women are as they go through the program is something just really relatable as well. Wow. I'm a bit gobsmacked, actually. I've never heard anything done like this before. Are you guys the first to kind of pioneer something like this? You know, when we when we started filming, I, I think we were. I think there's some other programs out there that are um, quite similar um, but not to the same depth as the Empowered Motherhood program. Um, I haven't seen anything that covers the entire pregnancy and postnatal period and also covers um, the, the uh, we call them specialised programs. So we have a week-by-week -week program for pelvic organ prolapse we have a similar one for pelvic girdle and pubic pain in pregnancy. And we have a week-by-week -week program for both vaginal birth or C-section birth recovery. So I haven't seen anything that covers it in the same depth. Um, we also have launched it in an app, mobile app as well. So I haven't, um, I haven't seen anything that's yet yeah, quite the same, but I know there's, um, you know, so many incredibly talented physiotherapists and um, and um, perinatal exercise specialists that do have, you know, their own online programs. So um, I want to acknowledge all of the women who are doing work in this space. But, yeah, obviously I'm probably biased. Yeah. <laughs> well, the thing is too though, right, when I was pregnant, I didn't just buy one book, pregnancy book. I think I bought about 10. So you're kind of reading all different perspectives. So if someone has another program, there's nothing to say that they couldn't also get your program because they could get something that they – might not get somewhere else. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that's, um, I, I have a yoga membership. I have a Pilates. I have my own program, you know. I um, Yeah. But I love exercise as well. So I, I love to move and I love learning. So I find all of those really valuable investments for me. So, yeah, great. That's awesome that you found your niche for you as Kim. Like this is your passion now that, you know, like you said in the law, it was like I did it but I didn't love any of those topics that they wanted me to specialize in but now I love it I can tell by the look on your face like just light up when you mentioned it it's amazing yeah, yeah I feel you. so lucky to have something I'm so passionate about um and you know I have big dreams for it because I think as a woman who went through this experience and you know when I was first diagnosed with prolapse um I was given a PDF with Kegel exercises and a huge list of things I couldn't do. And so for someone who was used to being so active in my life, I, I could not believe. And also as an elite athlete who was, you know, I'd received the best support possible when I was injured. I'd been given round-the-clock physio treatment. I'd been 
introduced the latest technology. And so for this physical injury that I suffered as a result of birth to be given two pamphlets and then sent on my way to fend for myself, it like, it really rocked me. And so I just, I truly believe, and I know that Liz does too, that women deserve better. We, you know, birthing population is a huge part of the Australian population and we are still being treated like second rate citizens. So um, I truly believe women deserve better. And especially those who um, are living in rural communities and or, you know, socioeconomic they might not Absolutely. be able to access women's health physios and obstetricians. So, oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. So tell us, um, I know you've mentioned that you have pelvic organ prolapse and incontinence. I think our listeners would be interested to know a little bit more about that in terms of um, when did you first know that you had prolapse and did you even know what the word was <laughs> back then? So I I never had heard of the term and I think that's a huge problem that the first time women hear of pelvic organ prolapse is when they're diagnosed with it, which can induce a lot of fear and overwhelm. Um, so the, and also never in all of my career had I even heard of the importance of the pelvic floor. You know, I knew all about <laughs> anterior cruciate ligament injuries, never once heard yeah. about my pelvic floor. And isn't that crazy? Because you would have been jumping up all over that netball court for 12 years and no one ever talked about the thing that holds you all inside. <laughs> and, and, and I used to leak, like at the end of a really heavy session, I would leak and that's a giant red flag and no one, like, I mean, obviously I was embarrassed, so I probably didn't, in their defense, I didn't bring it up. <laughs> yeah, but, of course. But that is actually quite a red flag going into pregnancy that you are already leaking pre pregnancy so yeah I mean I, again just the lack of awareness and education is um, uh, amazing in, in not, not in a good way so the first time after the birth of my first daughter Allegra at about four weeks I felt like that sensation that everything's falling out that women often describe with prolapse and so I went up to the hospital where I birthed her and they said it all looks really normal and <laughs> I had a look in the mirror and look, uh, please look at your vaginas before you have a baby. Don't look postpartum because I, I was like, I had no idea what I was looking at. You know, I didn't know what I was seeing really. And so I took that advice. I still, you know, if you understand my past, I still had that fitness business. I was really active. So at six weeks, I was like out there. I wanted to run. I wanted to go back to exercise. And I went to the GP for my six-week check and she said that she thought I had a pelvic organ prolapse. Um, and then I think I was really lucky because I was referred to see Liz. Oh, straight away. Straight away. Yeah, good. So that was the really fortunate part of, of my journey. Um, Liz really took into account me as a person and the type of person I was and balanced that against the the damage and trauma she could see to my pelvic floor and how weak my body was internally. Um, and so I worked really hard to, to heal my pelvic floor, but I don't think at that point in time I really truly understood still pelvic organ prolapse. The significance I, of it. I knew there was something holding me back from where I wanted to be, but I didn't really understand the long-term um, consequences of that. And... I actually returned to a really yeah, good level of fitness and, and strength and um, was pretty um, symptom-free. I did wear a pessary and I had to okay. wait, I think it was five months to get fitted with a pessary because no one fitted them at that stage, which is a pessary is a medical grade silicon device that's inserted into the vagina and it, and it supports the pelvic organs. Um, so I had to wait, yeah, five months to be fitted for that. So it wasn't probably until after the birth of my second daughter that I really started to get it because obviously with every pregnancy, there's a little bit more load on the pelvic floor. The yeah, pelvic stretches floor muscles more. stretch a little bit more. Um, everything becomes a little weaker. Um, and the hiatus the, um, through which the, you know, the urethra, vagina and rectum pass becomes a little wider. So you often become a little bit more symptomatic. Um, so, yeah, it probably wasn't until the, after the birth of my second that I really got it. And I was like, this is 
and that was a huge unraveling for me. Yeah. Um, because I, I didn't know, I no longer saw myself as invincible, you know, it's like, um, I think as an athlete, you're sort of told you can do things that other people can't do and that you can push yourself and get, you know, with enough hard work, you can get there. And I never think I was the most talented player, but I was a really hard worker. Um, so that was sort of my, you know, modus operandi. So um, I knew that I couldn't outwork this really. It was just sort of, and my, my prolapse isn't from a lack of strength of pelvic floor. It's the connective tissue and the fascia and, you know, my um, biomechanics and the fact that I'm really mobile body, all of those things. It's not just, I can't just strengthen my pelvic floor and rid- Heal, heal myself you know yeah no amount of kegels are going to get you where you were so did with it um was it Liz that was able to diagnose you with the type of because there's like so many types of prolapse right and then there's different grades of prolapse so that when people say oh I've got a prolapse I just did some kegels and I was back to normal and then when I say oh I've got prolapse and I can't walk or stand they look baffled because even women with prolapse don't understand that women can have like five different types and four different grades and you can have avulsions, which I've got that um, they're like, oh, can't you just put a pessary in? And it doesn't, it's not like that because even that level of education is really hard to find. So did Liz um, kind of give you a grade and a type to work with? Yeah, so um, I have a a grade two, um, sister seal, but it's almost, it's quite low. So it's almost like the urethra is, is, it's right down sort of there. So which is hard because a pessary sits above that. So I, I don't often find a pessary very helpful. Um, I also have quite a low sitting cervix, which I don't think used to, but it's not, a, I don't have a uterine prolapse, um, but it, it can make me feel symptomatic because it's yeah, sitting low. It wouldn't help. Yeah. Um, and so I think after the birth of my first daughter, I sort of got that sister seal back to a grade one. Um, and then after the birth of my second, it was back to grade two. Um, and now it generally sits at around a grade two. So um, just for people who maybe, if you want me to explain, aren't aware. So grade one, you, there's some laxity in the pelvic floor muscles, but the, the organs themselves are pretty much sort of where they were. But when you cough or bear down, they they might move. Um, grade two is where the organs start to descend into the vaginal canal, but they don't. You can they might be visible, but they definitely don't protrude, or they're not at the entrance. Um, and then grade three is at the entrance, and grade four is beyond beyond that. So it's um, grade two, I think, is still quite manageable with treatment like. Um, and, and especially um, with, you know, pelvic floor treatment, better movement patterns, better breathing patterns, better bowel habits, um, diet. Eating, it all ordered. intertwines. Yeah. Mm. So, but I still feel like I have quite a good quality of life. I don't, you know, I've changed the way I exercise, but I still have quite a good quality of life. Okay. That's awesome to hear. That's really good. And it's funny because um, it's when people first contact me who are newly diagnosed and they're devastated, it's hard sometimes to think back how I felt five years ago, nearly six years ago, because I now have just learned to live with it the best way I can. So we live this adjusted, uh, varied life that you see the positives in everything that you can do. So it's hard to sometimes think back and empathize and say, you know, yeah, it's really shit. Actually, I'm so sorry it happened to you, but I can't because women have said, oh, well, are you okay now? Are you fixed? And I'm like, no. Mm. (laughs) Oh, but you you come across like really positive and stuff. Well, that's a lot of work physically. So even though I can't get my prolapse up to a better grade, I know that if I don't do pelvic floor exercises and if I don't do core strength, the symptoms are felt more, right? So the more I do that, I can feel better. I can't fix it. But it also includes a lot of psychological help throughout the years to to come to terms with it and be okay with it and just be like, well, that's what it is. It's finding that level of um, resolve, I guess, and just like, yep, yeah, resilience. it is what it is. Yeah, yeah. It's um, you know, it's funny because I obviously in the 
in the um, Empowered Motherhood program, we have a lot of women who are newly diagnosed. And as part of the, it's an online program, but I wanted it to be quite supportive. So as part of it, we, we welcome them all individually and recommend individual workouts and based on their symptoms and their experiences. So I have a lot of women who have just been diagnosed with prolapse who come into the program. And it's that, um, you know, if they have to go on their own journey, but I feel like they have to have some hope as well. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you're the same. We, can't, we don't project our own experiences with prolapse onto others because they can, if they are a grade one or two, they can, you know, they can have that healing and they can return to, to running perhaps or, or to the things they want. So every woman is so different. It's, um, it's, but it's giving them the tools and the education they need to make those choices for themselves and the support so they can find their own way because in a very strange way I sort of believe that this happened to me to teach me the lessons I need to learn to get to this point I think if I just can healed from birth really well went back to running I would have been I would not have been empathetic I wouldn't have understood other women's struggles you know I would have I wouldn't be patient with myself and maybe I wouldn't have been as patient with my kids. So um, in a, if I look at it in more positive light, it's taught me a lot of, you know, hard, hard lessons about myself, um, which I probably needed to learn, you know. But, um, you know, I, I, I hopefully I could have learned them another way, but th- this is what I've been given. So, yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's so true. And it's hard to tell someone who's newly diagnosed that. You know, I say, oh, I just take the positives out of it. I wouldn't be doing this amazing podcast or doing anything to do. Brave Mumble wouldn't even exist. I would be teaching in a school. I'd be at nine to, you know, nine to three and then coming home and working and trying to do with kids and I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. So you do have to choose to look yeah, for other things. And it is a journey and it can take a really long time to be okay. Um, But once you do find it, good, right? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and look at us both. Like, um, where? How old's your eldest? Uh, she's turning six in October. Six. Yeah. So you're six years into this journey. I'm eight years. You know, it's a it's a long time, and that timeline seems really overwhelming. But I I also think there's like there's big learning curves along the way, and then we just you know you potter along where you're at, you feel fine, and then you have this another big you know learning curve. Um, yeah. So it's just it's just like we just yeah I don't think um newly diagnosed women can look so far ahead because it feels overwhelming (laughs) so you just look okay let's start just start where we can start focus on what you can do now what's in your control now and let's focus on that yeah yeah and that's awesome that you offer that support with the program because I think that's what's lacking a lot is that that level of support's just not there I mean you can maybe find it you can probably pay for it but like you said, there's a massive waiting list to talk to certain people and to get that help. So that's awesome that it's it's right there for women to access when they need it. Because as mums, you can't always go to an appointment at, at 10 o'clock in the morning when you're either breastfeeding. But if you've got it right there on your phone, you can be at 2 a.m. feed or, or whatever you're doing and it's right there. That's awesome. Yeah. And I think as well, like, um, you know, I'm a huge advocate for women's health physios and going to people in person. I think that's just the absolute gold standard but you can't go every day so you need stuff you can do in between and that's why I think you know the workouts we have like the um we have like you know pelvic floor for prolapse that is for the end of the day when you're feeling really heavy and you want to release and find space within your body and and lift it up and you know there's there's things like that that people need day-to-day support with you know that no matter how much professional help you're seeking on a one-on-one basis, you, you know, there's, there's stuff that can support you the rest of the time. Yeah. Yeah, that's right because it never – prolapse just doesn't come once a week. It's yeah, yeah. all the time, <laughs> yeah. especially in the afternoon. So, Kim, I want, to, I want to have this conversation with you about – because we've both got daughters and it's – I mean, I know it's just as important for my son to understand this as well eventually, but for our girls, we – you didn't know what prolapse was. I didn't know what prolapse was. I afterwards had a conversation with the women in my family. They all seemed to know what it was, but no one ever told me. And I remember someone saying, well, why didn't you ask? And I said, I didn't even know the word. I'd never heard the words pelvic organ prolapse. So 
I can't ask what I don't know. For our girls, how can we have honest conversations with them about childbirth and considering that our experiences are all very different? Um, and when might be the right time? So I know that I can say this now because my daughter's six and I'm pretty sure by the time she's kind of 16 onwards, she's will probably be like me and won't want to talk to her mum about this stuff. How do we get through? How do we get in, you know? Mm. <laughs> mm. Such a good question. Um, so I think that all women um, are almost wrapped in cotton wool when it comes to childbirth and protected. And we're, you know, quite independent, intelligent, strong, capable people if we have the right information, we know to ask the right questions, we can seek the right support, um, you know, then we can make informed and empowered decisions, hopefully before we're diagnosed <laughs> um, and before labor and a long time before we're in labor. So for me with my girls at the moment, it's starting with talking about their body parts properly. It's not front bottom. It's, you know, your, your vagina, your urethra your rectum you yeah. know we say vulva vulva yeah absolutely yeah. yep yep so they know they they already know how babies are delivered into the world I haven't spoken with them about how they're made <laughs> I'll wait a little while they're only eight and six but they know how babies are delivered and they know that I have had um that my I I don't think they will probably understand the pelvic floor but they know that I have had had um, injuries from childbirth um, that I don't phrase in a fearful way. It's just that my body couldn't quite handle the load that was placed upon it. But, you know, I'm so grateful I've got you guys and I would do it again. But, you know, I can't hold in my wee the same way you can. So can you please let me go to the toilet first? You know, like it's just it's just everyday things because they see me holding like holding on like a little kid, you know, um, or they, they know that some days I'm like, I can't pick you up today. I'm sorry. Like, um, that's hard. Hey, you know, it's really hard. That yeah. It's really you. hard. Um, and so I, I try to be honest with them, but I think I, I agree that, and I don't want to, I don't want to project any of my own experiences onto them because hopefully they won't be their experiences you know hopefully they'll know enough from me to seek support and and hopefully the system will change there'll be a systematic change by the time that that you know that women are given a lot more support in pregnancy and postpartum um but I think at the very least I would love them to know enough that they can ask the right questions and seek the right support and if that's not for me, that's fine. You know, it could be from anyone. Um, yeah, yeah, that's right. But at least they've got the, the what, like the terminology even to ask certain things. I think, like you said, we grew up in that generation where we would never say the word vagina near our dad yeah. because we would be, I and mean, some families did, but in my experience, we didn't. And writing a book the day my vagina broke and my dad looking at it and, and I, I, it was awkward for him and then I – it was awkward for me, but then I think over time we've kind of desensitized ourself enough that I can now say vagina in front of him and he blushes less and less less and time, less. which is lovely. <laughs> my dad gave my girls a bath the other day and he was washing them and he's like, don't put soap near our vagina, it self-cleans. <laughs> You're doing an amazing job, Kimmy. If your kids oh can god. say it's and so oh clean, my god, he's that's like, brilliant. You can, you can bath them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's brilliant! I love it. Yeah, yeah I well, love it. The fact it. that he was I even was in so there bathing them is yeah. amazing. <laughs> yep, yep. It's um, yeah. Look, to be honest, I think. It is a really fine line because I, I have obviously said that I don't want ever, I never want Elsie to think that her birth did like she was responsible or involved in any way whatsoever what happened to me during her birth. Um, but at the same time, and I don't want to project that this birth trauma or that prolapse can happen because it might not happen for her. But at the same time, I am doing these ones in the background kind of thinking really hard how am I going to communicate to her 
that she needs to do that prenatal she needs to know her about her pelvic floor all of those things without her being grossed out so that's the kind of like my mission my individual mission that I can have those conversations with her where she can go and seek help from someone and, and be educated so that she knows better than what we did what we did um, and and it, I think it's so funny because like little boys often seem to me to be so proud of their penis and their you know and little yes, girls that I've got are one told of those to hide the, it. Yeah. And so I think if we can change that narrative, um, then they're not embarrassed about their body parts, you know, and they're not embarrassed to seek help about it. And it is, you know, it's a um, – and I don't think it's just little girls. Like, you know, we have a uh, we have a video called um, The Real- Realities of Birth in Australia and it, It's really confronting to watch because it goes through the statistics of birth, not in a way that creates fear, just in a way that says, you know, one in three um, women might have this and one in two might have this, you know. And so it, but I think when would you rather have that information? Would you rather have it now when you can process it logically when you can make decisions okay well if that's the case what can I do about it um and and how can I prevent it and what are my strategies and what you know um or would you rather be told in labor when your you know prefrontex is is closed down and you're primal and you know and you can't make good decisions yeah it's (laughs) like so it's it's not just little girls it's like growing women now (laughs) we need to be having these conversations because society is almost failing them in a way um and that's when I see like you know we have a lot of second and third time mums in the program which is which is amazing but when I see a first time mum I just cheer because I think oh my god like yes you're going to get all this incredible information now and hopefully you know you'll do the program and you'll just continue on with your life normally you know like um So, yeah, that gives me like a bit of goosebumps because I think I just, you know, hopefully they can change. We're changing the narrative like one woman at a time. Yeah, that's brilliant. And, you know, when you were describing your course before, it's like you were just describing the whole brief on the long-term plan. So our long-term goal has always been to provide more education uh, from the start of your pregnancy throughout your nine-month journey And yes, you will visit an obstetrician who will tell you about what a cesarean is. You will visit a midwife who will tell you about vaginal birth and natural birth with no uh, interventions and medication. You will get to talk to someone about what forceps are so that you are not presented with them between your legs at the 11th hour. You have contact with a counsellor who can actually let you talk through your fears instead of you being constantly told, stop worrying, you'll be fine. And then, you know, potentially even having conversations with a doula. So a lot of people are like, well, what's a doula? These are like this, they're really popular at the moment, but what do they actually do? So having those conversations throughout that nine months so that, yeah, you are informed to then go, I'm going to go this way. Oh, actually, no, that way and this way. So you can shift and change rather than when it's too late, when your legs are in those stirrups and there are forceps down there. You are not empowered anymore. You do not. You do not have decisions, and you are putting your life and, well, firstly, your baby's life, in the hand of the professionals. And uh, there's nothing you can do. So, I like you. Your program sounds like it's it's pretty much just followed that exact same idea, which is amazing. Yeah, and I think like at that point in labour, like most women don't care about themselves. They just care about no. their baby's health. That's all they care about. And being alive. And my third pregnancy, like, and I was so hyper aware of prolapse and everything through that whole pregnancy. And obviously my symptoms were way worse. And when I was pushing her out, they were like, slow down. And I was like, I don't care. I don't care. Just get her out. They're like, you will care. You do care. Take your time. But I, you know, I, I honestly did not care about my pelvic floor at all at that moment. I didn't care anything about myself. I just wanted to see a healthy baby. And so we, you know, those decision-making processes then aren't rational. They're just primal. So yeah, yeah, so so true, yeah. I love it. It feels like, and I feel like by even having this conversation and sharing this podcast with the world and this episode in particular, 
women tuning in may it may even just a penny might drop go actually I think I need to find out more about that do you know I had this conversation last week Kimmy with another author she wrote a book for dads it's called Cheese to Childbirth and in there she talked about how women sometimes project their birth trauma to as a way of processing which you know I don't understand that because my husband and I kept it a secret for two years because we didn't want to tell anyone we, we thought we failed calm birth we thought we'd failed natural childbirth um but she said your book is probably more for people in the medical field and I do think that potentially not I don't agree and for the reason that I think she's right that maybe women that are pregnant right now could be scared at that one chapter about my specific trauma but before you were pregnant, to read that and it takes you through all the processes like, you know, your insurance, the level of insurance matters because it matters on your decision if you want to have an obstetrician or a midwife, if you're going public or private, you know, you know, talking about doulas, all of those things that I never saw in pregnancy books. Pregnancy books I never saw, uh, a lot of them, what an episiotomy was. I was like, what? An episi what? Mm. <laughs> Mm. what are you doing Mm. (laughs) what are you cutting you know yeah um it's funny because some women will find it too much and and some women will just want to go with the flow and that's okay but if they have the options there then that's an informed decision on their part um if they don't have the options and they are not choosing to you know just shut themselves down and focus on themselves and that that's totally fine but if it's not an option then that's not fine you know yeah you Um, you don't know what you don't know I think I remember talking to my obstetrician for my second birth and he said I said what is this is Aaron anyway because you obviously calm birth we were not really allowed to talk about it because it was just the the it was very much indicated that it was the naughty corner you only have a cesarean if it's an emergency you never choose one uh, which is totally fine but I said to him so what is it anyway because I think I want one now after having that traumatic and prolapse once he explained it to me I was like oh actually that doesn't sound that easy it doesn't sound like an easy road out as what they portrayed on social media you know just like zip you open get the baby out and then you you just can't drive for a couple of weeks, but then you're totally fine. When he explained all of the risks and benefits of that, I was like, oh, yeah, nah, I'm okay. I think I might try vaginally again. <laughs> it's, um, and I wish that there was, I, my one wish is that that type of process happened for vaginal birth as well. We don't talk about risks and benefits you know, risks of forceps, risks of epidurals, risk, you know, we don't talk about any of that stuff and it feels like we're keeping a secret. It's like the worst secret you can keep from women and just let them work it out when they get there. And like you said, I respect if some women choose to do that, but if we're not even giving it there to share in the first place and there is no choice on the table at all, right? Mm. Yeah, it's, it's um, obviously like that's a big part of all of the stuff we share, we interviewed an obstetrician and, and he sort of goes through all of, you know, all of the different types of intervention, the different types of pain relief, um, the risks around each other, why an obstetrician might decide, you know, why they might try vacuum first before forceps, why they're reluctant to try forceps, what are the risks associated. But I think as well with, with C-section, it's... Um, it can be really stigmatized as an unnatural, you know, just the just the word natural or C-section. Um, whereas, you know, um, my business partner, Liz, she just had her, her second C-section. She had a maternal assisted C-section where she helped to bring her baby into the world and reach out and, and, and pull her baby from her womb. So, and like I watched a video of that and I just had like I've got tingles. It's just so beautiful. Um, and so, you know, like every single birth can be empowered and beautiful once we know once we have the information um the other thing i think is really important is like women you know we don't we prepare maybe mentally and physically but like a lot of people don't actually go in and prepare the pelvic floor for birth they don't see a women's health physio they don't get their pelvis shape checked they don't 
do pelvic floor down training and release. Um, and a lot of that pelvic floor work that women's health physios do during pregnancy can identify risk factors for women. Um, and even and it can be as simple as saying, I, I really would recommend you birth in this position. And yes, I, you know, that's right. it's yeah, like yeah. it's it can be so simple, or it might be like your your pelvic floor is incredibly tight right now. Like if if you want to have a vaginal birth, there's a lot of work we need to do between now and then. Like, let's get onto it. Let's have a plan. So, um, but I think it is changing and social media is like an incredible part of that because the conversation's out there way, way, way more. But um, still, it is quite taboo, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, I feel like you and I just have to keep chipping. Like it's like this massive iceberg that's got so much underneath, so much ingrained taboo, shame, guilt. Um, you know, like you said, women, are, men are very proud to get their penis out. Women are very, it's very hidden and covered and, you know, things like, and, you know, it's funny. I listened to um, uh, Ladies We Need to Talk and Yumi Steins educated me in pornography, right? Obviously, you're like they show men's the whole kit and caboodle, but women's labias it's illegal to show them, which is why they are always look really neat because you're not allowed to show them. Apparently, it's against the law, and I was like, Wow! <laughs> so, even our laws are failing us to know that my vulva is actually not obscure or weird, it's just the ones I've seen on videos yeah. look perfect, but they're not. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's it's so big. It's bigger than just one little me. But you and I can probably just chip away for our girls and chip away for our friends and our circles, which is what this conversation's been about. And I thank you so much. I've loved chatting with you. But Kimmy, I do want to know how do we find out more about your Empowered Motherhood program? Oh, thank you, and thanks so much for having me. It's been such an honour. I've really been grateful to be here. Um, so we have a website, empoweredmother.com.au. At Instagram, we are Empowered Mother underscore. And we have an app, Empowered Motherhood Program, which you can look up on the App Store or Google Play. Um, so, yeah. We'll definitely put all those links directly in the show notes so that people don't, um, you know, they just want to click straight in and they can find you and find out more about you, which is amazing. All right. Tell us, lastly, what's next on the cards for you, Kimmy? What's so, your next adventure? Um, so our our big long term vision is to make this program more accessible for women. So we uh, we really want to partner with you know government health bodies and private health funds um, to to try and make this program more widely available. Um, and yeah, so that's probably our long term goal, and that's sort of where we're at now. We've spent the last year just revising and improving and, and launching the app so we're quite excited for the next chapter um and also you know I'm feeling a bit nervous but yeah excited mainly <laughs> that's good they say right if you're not if you're not feeling scared then you're not thinking big enough so if the fact that you're a little bit nervous means that you're onto something it's amazing thanks again for coming on the show and uh, we look forward to watching your your next steps in your journey thanks Kim thanks so much Steph thank you <laughs> Bye. Bye. Kimmy Smith is such a kind and gentle soul that I feel that she didn't even, didn't even really kind of sell anything here because they honestly believe in everything they do is to help other women. I want to help you understand that how much is in this app and in this program is beyond anything that I've seen before. It's great to go and check things out for yourself. I have had a look at this and I don't I don't recommend things this hard ever because I know that people get to make their own decisions. What I would recommend is that you go and start their five-day free trial. Go and have a look around, see if it would be suitable for you then make your decision. I think that's the easiest and safest way to do it. The links will be down below in the show notes. And next week is our season final episode with Elaine Miller, who is a comedian from Edinburgh. And I can promise you, I did promise you in our very beginning episode that this show will make you laugh and cry and be inspired. 
I'm not sure how much laughing we've had yet, but I can tell you I have saved the best to last because we laugh through the entire thing. And that's a really nice way to finish the year, especially in this pelvic organ prolapse space. Until then, bye for now. Mommy.